obviously all the the news uh, in the in the headlines this week has been uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but I, I thought it'd be good to start the conversation with a little bit of context for um, for readers and viewers. Uh, obviously, people who have read your work for some time would would understand a lot of this context. But maybe let's just go back to the 2014 political situation in the Ukraine. And I noticed last week you you sent out a tweet which was a retweet of a 2015 comment that you made and said, look, this is all going to lead to, to another proxy war down the track, and, and, and here we are. So perhaps if you could just give uh, listeners a bit of background to the, the current day situation. Sure, and that's a good uh, good way to frame, uh, frame it, Greg. Uh, 2014 is a good starting place. This story actually goes back to uh, the, the early 1990s, but we don't need to take it all the way back. Uh, 2014 explains it all. And before I jump in there, I'll do it quickly. I should preface my remarks by saying that what's happening in Ukraine is a tragedy. Uh, and what Putin is doing is unforgivable. So I just want to be clear about that. But having said that, I'm an analyst, uh, I'm not a cheerleader, and I like to look at things in a very clinical way, and I do, uh, to in order to see where things are going, help our readers and our uh, our listeners, uh, you know, understand the world and also, um, you know, look out for the portfolios and hopefully make some smart investments. So uh, again, I want to be clear that there's no doubt in my mind about um, about the, the the tragic nature of what's going on there, and it is a, there's a lot of uh, human suffering. Um, having said that, I think it's too easy uh, to paint um, a Vladimir Putin as just this evil figure. Uh, when you do that, you're you're really missing uh, a lot of context, a lot of nuance. He, look, he started the war; it's on his hands. He, he's responsible for it. No, no question about that. Um, I don't buy into the. Uh, you know, Zelensky is the new Churchill. Zelensky is very much, uh, Zelensky is as responsible for the war as Putin. Uh, this war could have been avoided. And I really fought the United States and the U.S. State Department uh, and the White House. I, again, this is a war that could have been avoided. The fact that it wasn't avoided uh, represents as much a failure on the part of the United States and, and the Ukrainian government uh, as it does um, you know, a matter of pointing a finger at Putin for actually firing the first shot. So with that, let's just go back to what happened in 2014. Um, I always, uh, I say I'm always disappointed people don't know more about history. I don't know when schools stopped teaching it, but uh, there seems to have. But they also seem to have stopped teaching geography along the way. I mean, since I was like a four-year-old, I was always fascinated by maps. But uh, just get out a map, go to Google Maps uh, or your iPhone map or get a globe or atlas or any reference you like and just look at where Ukraine is. It's like a dagger pointed at Moscow. Um, the eastern part of Ukraine is actually east of Moscow. Moscow has not been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan. I mean, they've been there in wars back and forth, Napoleon, Hitler, uh, uh, you know, the Warsaw Bloc, the NATO, et cetera. That, that front in central eastern Europe, where, which Ukraine is part of, but also Poland and uh, Belarus and uh, Romania and Bulgaria and a lot of other countries, that, that's been fought over for, for centuries. But the idea that you could actually attack Moscow from the east, uh, which is which you can do from Ukraine, uh, is uh, unacceptable in, in the Russian view. Uh, so what they wanted for Ukraine, obviously the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, a lot of countries declared independence or became, a, became independent or autonomous. Uh, Russia was not in a position to stop that and chose not to. And and that was that. And so you had sent all the Central Asian republics and Eastern European republics and so forth. Um, but it was critical to Russia that Ukraine be neutral. And when I say neutral, it doesn't mean, you know, deep in the Russian camp. It just means neutral. Austria was neutral during the Cold War. Finland was neutral during the Cold War. Today, they're more pro-Western, but you know, that's that's today. But in the 1950s and 1960s, I mean, Austria was um, Austria, but it wasn't. It wasn't part of the EU. It wasn't part of NATO. It wasn't, uh, you know, really firmly in the Western camp. Um, that's what Russia wanted Ukraine to be. They had an election. They elected a, a president uh, who, in uh, late 2013, was clearly, I would say, pro-Russian. You know, he was he was running a, a middle ground. It was it was neutral, but he was clearly pro-Russian. Was the election probably corrupt? Yeah. Is there corruption in Ukraine? Absolutely. So I'm not saying this is some sort of you know, Athenian democracy, far from it. But it was an election. He was duly elected. The CIA and MI6 and the Obama White House and David Cameron in the UK and others 
uh, decided that wasn't good enough. They wanted Ukraine in NATO. They wanted others wanted Ukraine in the EU, and they staged a coup. Now they dressed it up as one of these color revolutions, you know, the the green revolution, the orange revolution, so forth, different places around the world. So they dressed it up that way, and they had protests in Maidan Square. But there were uh, agents provocateurs and uh, CIA agents and uh, snipers and others uh, working around the fringes, ginning it up, uh, killing innocent people. Uh, well, the the I wouldn't call it a demonstration or a revolt. I would call it a coup. It was successful. The president kind of fled for his life, went to Russia, um, and they then put in a U.S. puppet, uh, Poroshenko. It took a few months, but they installed him, uh, and then and then went on. But at that point, Ukraine was on a track to join NATO, join the EU, and you did have in effect a U.S. puppet government. Uh, Putin wasted. Putin, Putin saw this and said, "Okay, I made my." red line clear. I've made my intentions clear. I've made Russia's priorities clear. You just trampled over all of it. So now it's time for the pushback. And in a, in a matter of a few months, Putin took Crimea. Uh, and Crimea is pretty much Russian. Historically, it has been. And what a lot of people miss is that um, the Russian fleet is based in Crimea, in Sevastopol. And there's a reason for that. It's on the Sea of Azov. Uh, it has access to the um, uh, through the Bosporus to the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean, and eventually the oceans. The north That's it for Russia. The northern coast is frozen half the year. They're on the Arctic Ocean. So, um, the, uh, so that's, that's, that's critical. So there was no way that Putin could let that be you know, part of NATO. So they just took it, and that was that. Uh, and the world didn't do much about the sanctions for uh, So, But this idea that Putin just woke up one day and decided to annex part of a sovereign country is not true. He he did annex it, uh, but it was uh, historically part of Russia. Uh, their fleet was based there, and he was provoked by this revolution that sent a friendly president packing. Uh, uh, so uh, that's something that Americans, but I think people around the world don't have too much appreciation of. We go forward from there. You have a series of again puppet governments, utterly corrupt. Now you've got they're they're bribing the Biden administration, the Biden crime family, in the form of Hunter Biden, who was on the board of one of their largest natural gas companies, being paid millions of dollars uh, as a member of the board of directors. Uh, no skills, no talent, no language ability, no knowledge of um, natural gas or energy or pipelines or anything else. But it was a way to, in effect, bribe the the Biden crime family. Um, and uh, and and. Joe Biden, as vice president, even intervened in Ukraine to shut down the investigation of the sun. All that came to light uh, shortly before our U.S. election in 2020, uh, because Hunter Biden was so uh, out of it, so to speak. He left his laptop at a repair shop in Delaware and forgot to pick it up. And the owner, um, you know, looked looked into it because the guy didn't pay his bill um, and turned it over to the New York Post. Uh, and the New York Post published an expose on it, which was promptly um, deplatformed by Twitter. Google, Facebook, uh, as part of their effort to get Trump out of office and elect Biden. So Biden, meanwhile, was in his basement the whole time. So that worked. Um, but Putin stood in there the whole time saying, OK, you, you stage a, a phony color revolution to throw out the one pro-Russian president. Uh, you, um, uh, you, know, you bribe the vice president of the United States, who's now the president of the United States, through his son. Uh, and you continue to affirm the fact that you intend to join NATO and, and the EU. Uh, it, it was just too much. And by the way, if you, if you look at Estonia, again, back to the map list and look at Estonia in the north, you can draw the letter C from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, around to Ukraine and come out the eastern end of Ukraine. It's a semicircle around Moscow. And it's not as if they've never been invaded. I mean, Napoleon did it. Napoleon got into Moscow. The, the Russians used strategic depth, retreated, burned everything in their path, and, and Napoleon's troops starved to death, and they were decimated on the way back to France, but he made it. Hitler got to the outskirts of Moscow, ran, ran out of gas, got bogged down in the spring fighting season, uh, but came extremely close. So it's not as if the Russians don't have experience with this, and now they see NATO encircling Moscow, uh, there's nothing in between. There are no mountain ranges, no major rivers. Um, there's nothing standing in the way of a, just rolling up to a Red Square, uh, and that's unacceptable to the Russians. So, But I guess I'm struck by the, the number of times Putin warned people. He said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. All he wanted, and this gets back to what I said at the beginning, all you had to do to stop this war 
was to make a, a binding declaration, some kind of treaty or protocol that uh, Ukraine would not join NATO and that it would remain neutral. It could be independent, do your own thing, have elections, have autonomy, but you had to agree to two things. Don't join NATO and, by, and, and the EU, I say, and remain neutral. The U.S. refused to sign up for that, as did the U.K., as did the EU, as did NATO, as did Ukraine. Um, now, this is where it gets really complicated, because Zelensky, um, first of all, could, he could have stopped the war single-handedly by just saying, yeah, okay, we're not joining NATO, that's it, where do we sign? Um, it, and, and that's not appeasement, because it was never going to happen anyway. Appeasement is when you give up something you want to keep the other side happy, and it usually does not work with dictators. But Ukraine joining NATO was never going to happen. Why were people even talking about it? It's just, just again, look at the map, look at history. Uh, but they they clung to it. Zelensky's blunder, he made, he made a number of uh, major mistakes. One of them was not basically giving in on the NATO issue. But he actually thought that NATO would come to his rescue. He thought that, you know, as maybe a, not a NATO member, but, you know, aspiring NATO member, whatever you want to call it, uh, that it was just too much for Putin and um, he'd get bogged down and NATO would come. Not happening. Um, they're going to lose. Ukraine's going to lose this war. Putin's going to control the country. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying um, that, uh, that, it, that Putin won't have his hands full. He will, but, but he's going to win. Uh, and that's already in the works. Uh, they've, um, uh, you have to sort of, again, get the, the, the map out. Uh, but from a position in the, uh, in the northeast, the city of Kharkiv, uh, down to the southwest, um, uh, the, the city down there is Mer Mershon, which is on the um, uh, Dnieper River. Uh, the, the Russians have taken Mershon. They're, they're, there's a heavy siege of Kharkiv. They get those two. They can construct a line of control, a diagonal line of control from the northeast to the southwest. Now, the brilliance of that, first of all, you slice the country. You get about one third of the country, so that's going to be firmly under Russian control. But here it resembles what uh, the Wehrmacht did to uh, the Allied forces at the beginning of World War II. Uh, they, the Germans came through the Ardennes and went straight to the English Channel. Half the French army and the British Expeditionary Force were north of that line. They couldn't retreat to their own country. And they were cut off. The French surrendered. And the, the, the British evacuated. And the whole famous Dunkirk uh, evacuation. But nobody thought the Germans were going to come through the Ardennes and, and cut the Allied forces in half, which they did. Putin's going to do that in Ukraine. He's going to separate what's left of the Ukrainian army. So the, the portion caught in the pocket behind this line of control, they'll either have to surrender or be decimated. And, you know, I, I'm just kind of shaking my head at the U.S. media, the, all these armchair generals and people who don't know the history, don't understand the geography, et cetera, are they like, you know, Putin's bogged down in Kiev. He's bogged down in Kiev. He got this 40-mile convoy, and they're just sitting there, and they're stalled, and, you know, the ride of gas, whatever. It's nonsense. Kiev is not the first target on the list. It's the last target on the list. You go for the capital when you've got everything else under control. So the fact that, and uh, apparently the um, Russian amphibious forces are, are invading Odessa almost as we speak. So um, with the Russians, starting with Crimea, starting with Donbass, uh, Luhansk, Donetsk, taking Odessa, taking Kershaw, constructing the sign of control I described. And meanwhile, um, you know, the 40-mile the convoy, they're coming from the north, they're coming from Belarus. Well, they're not bogged down, they're waiting. This is a three-vector attack. Russia will be attacking Kiev from the east, uh, from the south with a line from Crimea, from the north, as I mentioned, coming from Belarus, and from the east uh, after uh, Kharkiv falls. So um, if, you're, if you're going to attack a city from three sides, you don't want one side to start without the other two. Then you might actually get picked off. So he's not stalled, he's not bogged down, he's waiting until the rest of the plan's in place and they're going to execute it. And, and this, this is not mostly uh, uh, Putin's plan. Of course, he's in charge, but you have to know General Gerasimov. General Gerasimov is probably the smartest general in the world. I wish America had a few more generals like him. But um, the, the Russians are methodical, they're brutal, they're violent, they're thorough, and they're patient. And those are all things you need. Um, everyone's saying after three days, oh, yeah, Putin's not going to win. He can't take care it took the, uh, the United States three weeks in the, in, the, uh, Gulf, in the Iraq war in 2003. It took three weeks to get from the Gulf to Baghdad. And that's with very little opposition under General Franks. So if it took the Americans three weeks to get to Baghdad, I wouldn't count Putin out after three days. So 
there's a long history here, mostly one of failure by the United States to recognize Russian interests, um, failure by the Ukrainian government to take some simple steps to prevent the war, Putin being disregarded and kind of having all his red lines ignored, and finally said, okay, enough's enough, here we go. So, Jim, you mentioned <clears throat> that Russia was going to win uh, this war. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what winning looks like. Firstly, what sort of time frame do you think we're going to be subjected to these these headlines and obviously the ongoing tragedy for loads of civilians that are that are involved in this but more from a broader geopolitical perspective what does winning look like because the way i understand my limited understanding of the ukraine is that there's a there's a the, the eastern portion of the country is pro pro western and and the western portion of the country is more uh, I guess nationalist Ukrainian. Does this result in a divided country? Is is Putin going for the the whole current territory of Ukraine to create that buffer zone between NATO and Russia? How how does it look? Yeah, I would expect that when it's done, um, Ukraine will be divided, if not quite down the middle. The the middle would be the Dnieper River, which runs from pretty much Kiev to um, Crimea. Uh, but uh, I would expect most of the East would either be uh, annexed by Russia, or just become part of Russia, or maybe if there are autonomous republics, they're loyal to Russia, they they uh, they look, uh, um, you know, you can call them puppet states, call them whatever you want, but basically controlled by the Russians. Russia doesn't really have any interest in controlling all of Ukraine. First of all, Ukraine's big. I mean, if yeah. you, uh, if if your uh, your our listeners are familiar with a map of America, I should have measured this out for the Australian audience. But um, uh, if you if you overlay a map of Ukraine on a map of the continental United States, it goes from New York to Chicago, east west, and it goes from the Great Lakes to South Carolina. So it's about a quarter, maybe a fifth of the continental United States. That's how big it is. So even with 100,000 troops or 150,000 troops, you know, good luck controlling that much territory. But they don't have to. They're going to peel off the east, uh, most of the east, if not all of it. The puppet regime in Kiev, the puppet regime will then sign a treaty with, uh, sorry, set up a puppet government in, in Kiev that would be ostensibly Ukrainian, but obviously pro-Russian. So you'd be replacing the American puppet with a Russian puppet. This new government would then sign a treaty with Russia, uh, giving them the eastern one third approximately, and then pledging not to join NATO and and to remain neutral. In other words, they're going to end up promising what they could easily have promised three weeks ago, but they didn't. They got a war instead with a great human cost, and they're going to end up in the same place. And what will be, let's put sanctions aside for the moment, but what would be the U.S.? response to that if if it came to that do you think none i mean we, we could probably deny diplomatic recognition to the eastern provinces um maybe deny diplomatic recognition to the new government in Kiev because it's obviously would be installed by russia but that's about it uh the the more interesting question is we we know what the sanctions are the new ones are being imposed all the time i think i i'm actually keeping track of them and um we're up to 15 separate sets of sanctions adding new targets new banks new oligarchs you know new prohibitions etc but we've we've slammed out banged out 15 treasury announcements in the in the past uh 10 days or so but um but it'd be interesting to see how long they last um we know what they are um they can all be got around one way or the other the workarounds are some of them are already in place it does impose some economic pain on russia but they saw it coming um, the economic pain on the global economy will be worse, more costly than what's going to happen to Russia. Russia will suffer economically. There's no question about it. But the world will suffer more. Um, the people in the White House don't really understand. They're imposing them. I used to do, I worked for the intelligence community. I work for the military. Um, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I have a degree in international economics. I was one of the leading experts on sanctions. I actually used to do the hard work of getting the information needed to put the sanctions on because we don't just do it arbitrarily. Um, and, uh, you know, I've met with a lot of, a lot of people, State Department, Treasury, it's that they, by and large, they don't understand this. A few people do, a few military understood a little bit better, but they just say, yeah, throw on the sanctions, you know, it'll hurt them. They don't understand that every, um, every trade, every pay or receive has two sides. So if you tell the Russians they can't use SWIFT, okay, 
What if they owe money to the West? By the way, they do, tens of billions of dollars. You're telling them they can't pay off those creditors? Okay, well, then those debts are going to go into default. Who owns the debts? A lot of them are jammed into 401k plans or superannuation plans for everyday Americans. They're buried in uh, you know, emerging markets funds or European funds as sold by Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. I mean, I'm not picking on the investment banks. I'm just saying that debt is somewhere, and it's all gonna, a lot of it's going to go into default. Um, plus, they've... Uh, They've obviously allowed the energy payments to continue. Uh, the, you know, okay, so gee, I can't buy a Russian car. I wasn't planning to, but um, but you can buy Russian oil, and they have to because Europe has put itself in a position where it's gonna, they're going to freeze in the dark if they don't have. I said oil, yes, but also primarily natural gas. But if they don't have those Russian energy resources, they're going to shut down their industry, and people they're going to have blackouts, and people are going to, as they say, freeze in the dark. So they've got to get it. They got to pay dollars for it. The central bank's going to get the dollars. Now, what's extraordinary about these sanctions is for the first time, at least since the Cold War, but maybe ever, they've frozen the assets of a central bank, you know, of a major economy. I don't know about some little small dictatorship, but uh, they, they've frozen the assets of the central bank, which are over $600 billion. They have relatively few treasury securities. Uh, in portfolio, but they could be involved in uh, using dollars in foreign exchange swaps. Uh, and this is where it gets very murky, and it takes me back to uh, 1998 and the long-term capital management fiasco. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, well, if you're under you know, 50, you probably never heard of it. And if you're over 50, you may barely recall it, but I, I lived through it. I negotiated that bailout. And um, we were hours away from closing every every market in the world. That didn't happen because we did the bailout, but it was a close run thing, as Wellington said, and uh, we were hours away from shutting every market in the world. Now, we learned, oh, so hedge fund was over leveraged. Okay, fine. Uh, but it started with Russia. It started on August 17th, 1998, when Russia defaulted on their internal external debt and devalued the currency. And then that started a cascade because, you know, Credit Suisse was a big underwriter of Russian bonds. We had some long-term capital, but we didn't lose money. We didn't lose that much money in Russian bonds. We lost money on everything else and $1.4 trillion worth of derivatives when spreads widened because it was a full-scale global liquidity crisis. But it started with Russia. It did not start in Greenwich, Connecticut. It just ended up there. My point being, um, here we go again. Do you, do you really think you can inflict that much economic damage on Russia, which they have, without that coming back in a very densely connected web, of uh, which is what global finance and the global banking system is, uh, without creating a liquidity crisis all over the world. So the liquidity crisis, the global liquidity crises are different than stock market crashes in the sense the stock market will just crash all at once, you know, in a day or a couple of days or whatever, and then it tends to come back. Um, uh, yeah, but but the but a global liquidity crisis is more insidious. It's more like you know the stock market crashes like an earthquake. A uh, global liquidity crisis is more like termites. You know, they're just eating away, eating away at foundations that you can't see. And then one day the house caves in. We may be headed for that. Thanks very much for watching. If you're interested uh, in what Jim Rickards has got to say on a regular basis, uh, Jim also writes in the Daily Reckoning, which is a free daily e-letter, uh, Daily Reckoning Australia. Uh, he appears there on Wednesday every week. So please click on the link below, put in your email address, and you'll get that in your inbox. Or if you want to uh, subscribe to Jim's uh, Strategic Intelligence Australia directly, you can also do that uh, and get regular insights from Jim as well uh, and click on the link below for that one too. Thanks again for watching. We'll talk again soon. Bye.